On this episode of We're No Damn Experts, we share the final part of our conversation with James Parker Shield about the Native American culture and history in Great Falls, Montana. Best damn podcast, the best damn town. You want to get up, get ready to get down. Welcome to the greatest damn town in Montana, Great Falls. I'm Maricela Hazard, and Rebecca Ingham is my co-host. Today, we're sharing our final part of our conversation with James Parker Shield. And as a reminder, this was recorded back in January before Jason, who is our sales director and is also an audio genius, was on our team. So it's going to sound authentic. That's a nice way of saying it. He dressed it up as much as we could, but we hope you stay and listen to enjoy this final part of our conversation. Before I touch on the next topic, do you have anything on your notes that we haven't already covered? Great Falls, the unique history of Great Falls and Indian community. So you got to keep in mind, you know, we go back to the reservation days when Indians were put on the reservation. Well, then that means there were no black feet running around the Great Falls area because they were being confined to their reservation, uh, which is, you know, a couple hours north of us. Uh, the same way the Chippewas and Crees, you know, they were being confined, but but there was some, there were some uh, interesting developments. All these other tribes were on their reservations. And then uh, what was kind of impactful in this area, <clears throat> as well as some of the other cities or urban areas in Montana, especially Helena and Butte, was that there was the Chippewas that came in from the Turtle Mountain area uh, because basically the government had told them, we want you to give up more and more of your land. And when they got down to a real small parcel, Chief Little Shell and Red Thunder and some of the other leaders said, no, we're not giving up any more of our land. <clears throat> and the government representative said, well, you either sign or you won't be part of this reservation. Well, they didn't sign. So they basically went into exile and they were, they had already been hunting buffalo. The last buffalo herd on the Northern Plains was up around the, the Fort Peck Reservation. And so they were already hunting buffalo. They went back to Turmont to find out that, yeah, the government had basically sent, carried out their threat and told them you're not, you're not going to be on this reservation. So they were forced into exile and they came back into Montana and eventually worked their way across the High Line. Uh, of the upper part of Montana over into Great Falls and Helena. And uh, they were known as landless Indians because they had no land base. Uh, at the same time, uh, in 1885, another interesting event took place in Canada. And this is often overlooked in American history. You know, when tourists come to Montana, one of the first things they want to see is Custer's Last Stand, the Battle of Little Bighorn. An important historical event, you know, uh, that a lot of people know about and it's been overdone. But in Canada, uh, an event up there that's as famous as the Battle of Little Bighorn is the Real Rebellion. Uh, the rebellion, the Real Rebellion was huge in Canada. It involved Chippewas and Crees and mixed bloods. Okay. Uh, called Métis people in Canada that rebelled against the Canadian government. Once again, over land. Mm-hmm. And they fought a rebellion. And some of my ancestors were involved in that. Eventually, that rebellion was put down by the Canadian government. And some of the leaders were put on trial for treason. Uh, one was hung, Louis Riel himself. Uh, others, like Lucky Man and Wandering Spirit, were imprisoned. And so a, a, a large number of those people fled for political asylum into Montana. And they came down here, and they've been here ever since. Uh, they, they hid out. In the communities north of us, you know, Augusta, Decoyer, you know, all along the Front Range. And some of them spread over into uh, the High Line area. And, and of course, so then you have these two groups. You have 
you know, you had the Crees and mixed bloods from Canada, along with the Chippewas coming in from North Dakota. They, the Chippewas and Crees had always been kind of allies and quite often intermarried and camped with one another. So these two groups, uh, you know, basically hung out together. In the early 1900s, there was communities of them. And in order for them to survive, they were basically homeless people. And, and like homeless people, you have no shelter, you have no food, and you're just scrounging to survive. And so where you would find them quite often was near city dumps, like here in Great Falls, where they would actually dig in the dump for clothing, food, you know, because some of the markets would throw away the vegetables and stuff, and slaughterhouses where they would get the tripe that the white uh, people in the slaughterhouse would throw away because nobody ate that stuff. <laughs> to natives, it's, it's always been kind of a delicacy. And so that, that continued on, you know, when I was a kid, quite often we were over at the slaughterhouse on the east end of Great Falls and lined up with a number of other people and pick up some cars with our wash tubs from Saturday night baths and doing our laundry. Those also became where we would hand it up to the guy on the dock and he'd go in, put a cow gut in there, we'd take it home and clean and cook it. And we spent a lot of our uh, weekends at the city dump, uh, not only looking for clothes and food, but you could also pick metal, brass, aluminum, and copper. Uh, we became uh, very adept at uh, making a living off of uh, collecting scrap metal and selling it to Pacific Steel or Wiseman's. Our people did for many years, in addition to that, working on ranches, stacking hay, working on farms, picking rock, doing the work that a lot of other people didn't want to do and being paid very low, low wages, but it was how you survived. And then gradually you, you would have these encampments become like little communities. So that's one of the interesting things about Great Falls is that it had these, what I call little shanty towns that grew up on the outskirts of Great Falls. And there's three of them here in Great Falls. There's Wire Mill, right above Black Eagle, where I grew up in that community. Then there was uh, Mont Royal, which shoots up on what they call Skyline Drive now. And then there was Hill 57, which there's still a few families stuck there. And that was the most famous. In fact, if you read newspapers in the 1950s and, and early 60s, uh, Great Falls was notorious for the poverty-stricken uh situation of natives that lived on Hill 57. And of course, then there's the backstory of Hill 57 itself. How did they get that name? Uh, we're probably the only Indian community in the country that has a connection with a multi-billion dollar food company. You know, Heinz 57 sauces, mm -hmm. which when Heinz uh, was first building his empire back in Pennsylvania, he developed a, lot, a line of a number of different condiments and, and sauces. And he also had a nationwide sales force and he would have his salesmen travel. And basically the first thing he had to do was he had over 57 products, but his marketing move was to reduce the number of products he offered back down to 57. Nobody knows why he picked that number, but that's what he stuck with, 57. And so that's why it's on the bottles and all that. Well, then they would go out and his salespeople were also told that get our sign on farmer's barns. Mm. Anything that was an edifice, anything that would serve as a billboard. Some guerrilla marketing. Get them up there, you know. And so when a salesperson uh, came through Great Falls, that's the tallest hill around. And so there was a big sign up there. Heinz, 57. So eventually... When people would talk about that encampment of natives that lived on below that hill, mm -hmm. they started calling them Hill 57 Indians. There's been a lot of uh, a lot of history huh. there, a lot of articles. If you go back and research the archives, like I said, notoriety about the conditions, you know, poverty stricken conditions, which is once again that makes Great Falls very, very unique in the whole country because. Think about it, in the, in the 40s and 50s, even in the 30s, that community was there. Nowhere else in the country was there any talk about an urban native community or their living, their lifestyle or the conditions. But there was, and there was, there was nation, there was magazine articles, a lot of newspaper articles, 
And, and then to, to add to that, there was the attention that was generated from the involvement of a nun uh, who was well known in this community back in those days, Sister Providencia, who took it upon herself to try to address you know some of those those conditions of, of uh, especially the younger the kids that lived on Hill Fifty Seven and in the other two in the communities because she used to come to our community too you know and so that that makes Great Falls unique. I always thought that there should be a a visitor center developed up there. Because, like I said, it, 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 it was the one of, one of a kind. There's nowhere else in the country that I can think of uh, where you had. Because you have to keep in mind, for many, many years, Natives were not allowed to leave the reservation. You know, you were confined there. And then even when it became possible for you to leave, that was usually due to something like World War I, where Indians would act, you know, even though they weren't even citizens, because we never became citizens of this country until 1924 through an act of Congress. Before that, uh, you, weren't, you weren't a citizen, but we had quite a number of uh, natives, including both my grandfathers, who fought World War I for this country. So it's it's interesting history. And then you look at when were Indians allowed to come to reservations, I mean, leave reservations and, and come to urban areas. Like I said, uh, I think both of those wars kind of uh, created a certain amount of uh, movement and the government started relaxing its control enough to where they would actually let you go look for jobs and stuff like that. Uh, so you had you, an influx of natives come that way. But the big, the biggest one was in, in the 1950s when they, the, the Congress passed the Indian Relocation Act, where they actually really wanted to get rid of reservations. And so they started uh, setting up this program called Relocation Program, where they would actually send you to Los Angeles or Seattle, Chicago, these big urban areas where uh, you were to get into training schools or get a job or maybe even get some sort of a, an education. And so there, there was those urban populations that grew. But Great Falls was ahead of all of that. We already had an urban We already population. had it. Yeah. And uh, uh, it was a large population. Great Falls is, uh, and so that's that's another one of those, those interesting aspects of, of, of Indian history in Great Falls. Just recently, the Little Shell finally received their federal uh, recognition of a tribe in yep. it was just two, a year ago. It feels like a hundred years yeah. ago now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, and that, and that's, that goes back to what I talked about, you know, yeah. you know, Chief Little Shell, his followers not wanting to let any more land go back in 1892. Mm -hmm. And so when the government said, well, you're not on this reservation, then basically they became a tribe that had no official status with the United States government, which meant no services, nothing for over 100 years. And that's been a continuous fight. You know, I've been involved there for many years. So it was gratifying to finally see that we, we got our status back as officially recognized that we exist. I mean, there's... There's nothing worse than told, being told you, you guys don't exist. exist. <laughs> you aren't real. Yeah, you're not real. You're invisible. <laughs> you know? So we got our status back, and and uh, now the tribe owns three buildings in town. They just bought the U.S. Bank building on the west side. Okay. And they own another building across the street, and uh, and of course we have a cultural center up on here for the seven where a number of our people live. We're already making great strides, and. But there's, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of history here. You know, it just needs to be discovered. And from a long, long time ago, up until now, that history continues to be made. Oh yeah, you know, one of the things, I, one of my favorite things to point out, and I shared this with Alyssa when she first came to Great Falls a couple months ago. Uh, I took her out to Fort Shaw, mm -hmm. and Fort Shaw, uh, which is only about 25, 30 miles outside of Great Falls used to be an army fort. Mm -hmm. And then when it closed down as an army fort, uh, and of course, let's go back. The reason why it's called Fort Shaw is because if anybody has seen that movie, Glory, which is uh, about an all black regiment in the Civil War, they were all black except for one guy. Their captain was a white guy and his name was Shaw. And that's who that fort was named after. So there's that historical connection as well. But it uh, closed down as a, as a fort once, you know, all the Indian wars were over and then was turned into an Indian boarding school 
And my grandfather was there. And when I was a little boy, he used to tell me stories about his day at Fort Shaw Indian Boarding School. And of course, Fort Shaw Indian Boarding School was like any other Indian boarding school. Their job was to make you less Indian, cut your hair, punish you for speaking your language and practicing your, your, your customs and your beliefs. And at the same time, teaching the boys how to be farmers or ranchers uh, and teaching the girls how to be seamstress and, and uh, you know, those domestic sort of things. And guys would also learn things like masonry or carpentry. There's some some interesting things that would develop in those Indian boarding schools. And at Fort Shaw, of all things, uh, they started a girls basketball team. And they had, a, they had a young guy working there that, that taught him the game. They actually started playing basketball before the boys did. And then the stunner was they were really good. Surprise. They were just dead-eye shots. <laughs> and they actually, in 1904, at the St. Louis uh, World's Fair, they took on a number of teams and beat them badly oh. and were declared the world's champions in basketball. And so there's a monument out there that was erected in honor of those young girls uh, becoming world champions. That's one of the great stories, you know, I think in, in Montana history and has brought a lot of accolades to this area. So if you come to Great Falls, you've got to go to Fort Shaw and see that memorial. And then learn the history, if you haven't already on this podcast, at the History Museum, there is an exhibit there yes. for the Fort Shaw World Champion Indian Girls Basketball Team. Yeah. <laughs> the, the most obvious thing you'll see when you look at that exhibit is the fact that they play basketball wearing dresses. This is- Really? Clear down to their ankles. Yeah. And so then... Baggy shorts, you know, is nothing new. You <laughs> are playing baggy dresses. Yeah. Um, and I think, I want to say PBS just did a thing on the Indian Girls Champion Basketball team with uh, the ancestors of that team. Mm-hmm. Which are they any good? Yeah. I don't and, know and if it, they've been assembled to play. Well, yeah, yeah. We could make an exhibition. Well, and then yeah, and then there was like the documentary that was put together or a book or something like that. That would that, that the, the whole thing. I mean, this was forgotten history until Dottie Susag, who was a teacher out there, took it on as a class project and had her students do the research. And they're the ones that that brought the story out to the public. Oh. It just took off from there. Uh, there's a book, there's a documentary. And like you know, Rebecca said, there's a nice display at the History Museum here in Great Falls. And, and the History Museum does a pretty good job, you know, uh, with that. Uh, you know, I've visited with them quite often. And, and of course, they have that, uh, that CD, the documentary that was made yeah. about the history of Great Falls. And when that film crew was doing that, they came to my office and asked me to share some information about the history of the Indian community, which I... I thought it was a nice touch, you know, because how can you talk about Great Falls without talking about exactly. Americans? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, it came out pretty good. Now, today, with all that history that James has shared with us, you're not done creating cool things. You have started the National Native American Hall of Fame, and this is a across the globe situation, um, even though you're headquartered here in Great Falls, Montana, which is super cool. But you honor, in a very impressive ceremony, Native Americans that have provided significant impact into differing segments of our society, culture, and history. Share a little bit about this project and how it got started and what you're doing with it today. Well, I got the idea about at least 10 years ago. Of course, I had to think about it for a while. Then I I ended up retiring, stayed out of my place in the country, built a barn, got done with projects out there and then uh, got bored and thought, well, I'm going to come out of retirement. So what do I do? I want to do. And I remember I had this idea that I always thought there was a need. There's a lot of halls of fame in in America, but there isn't one for Native Americans. And I thought there should be, Uh, especially when you start thinking about, okay, uh, there seems to be this big gap in public awareness of Native Americans from when they were fighting the Indian Wars, then the last you kind of hear about them is they're on the reservation. But after that, what the heck happened? And then you, you make that jump from there to Dances with Wolves. <laughs> <laughs> you know, something like that, you know. Yeah. Or, of course, before that, John Wayne. But you, you, you don't really know that much in America about 
what I call contemporary Native Americans or what they've achieved. And so I, I wanted to uh, help educate the public about that. But at the same time, there's been so many people uh, in, uh, you know, in Indian country that have achieved greatness. And of course, among our people nationwide, there are names of people that are said with a great deal of respect and awe, things that they fought for as far as advancing the cause of Native Americans uh, and bettering lives for all of us in America. And also for those that were the ones that would kind of break the path, you know, people like Jim Thorpe. Because when it comes to contemporary Native Americans, and by contemporary, I mean anywhere from the Civil War to today, and the reason why I picked that particular demarcation line as far as the dates is because I was always struck by the fact that right as you were kind of ending the, the last couple of decades of Indian wars in this country, there was another war going on back east, a civil war, and there was over 20,000 Native Americans that fought in that war. On both sides, right? On both sides. Yeah. A couple more were pretty notable. On the side of the South was Stan Wade. Uh, leading a Cherokee brigade. You know, he was a brigadier general, and he was the actually last Confederate general to surrender. And then on the side of the North, if you uh, look at images of Appomattox Courthouse, where General Grant and General Lee met to basically discuss the terms of surrender, there's a number of officers that are in that room, but there's a dark-skinned guy. And he was one of the officers. He was named Ely Parker. He was a Seneca Indian from New York, and he was a brigadier general. He was on Grant's staff, and he was probably the most educated man in the room. Uh, he had gone to law school, become a lawyer, but because natives were not citizens of their country, he could not be admitted to the bar to practice law. So, so what he does then is also equally impressive. He enrolls at the most prestigious engineering school in the country, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Rhode Island, and becomes an engineer. And he ends up uh, with the Ar U.S. Army uh, Corps of Engineers building bridges. And Did he then, also build a dam? Huh? Did he also build a dam? She's Probably. hooked up. <laughs> We're going to say he did. Yeah. There, there we go. Yeah. we got to bring it full circle. And, and, and carry that further, we'll say that he was influenced by beavers <laughs> in his culture. <laughs> there we go. Beavers could do it better than man. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so he ends up basically being a very educated individual, and he's on Grant's staff. And when they met at Appomattox Courthouse, he's the one that drafted the surrender document. And I always thought that was very interesting and fascinating. That's the point that we go from with the Hall of Fame is from the Civil War up until today. And so what we try to do is not only honor uh, Native Americans who had a great impact in moving the cause of Native Americans forward, mm -hmm. but also honoring those who, uh, in spite of, you know, racism that may still exist or barriers or cultural hurdles or whatever obstacle they had to overcome, they did it, you know, like Billy Mills or or Maria Talchi, many people aren't aware of that. Uh, around Christmas time, you know, it's kind of a tradition in America that people are enthralled with the Nutcracker, you know, that great ballet, right? Well, people don't realize that it was a Native woman that was the ballerina that, that made that famous. Oh. And that was Maria Talchi. She was, in fact, America's first prima ballerina. Oh. She was the first American to, to dance at the Bolshoi Theater in Moscow. She was oh. the one that made the New York ballet famous wow so a lot was, of history and yeah. so for the rebecca said that this is headquartered in great falls our office is here the 2021 ceremony that's november and that's going to be in oklahoma right yes so if everything goes 2021 is going to be our good big brother kick 2020 in we the butt so. and we things so. uh get we a little bit of normalcy so yeah, these are the people so. that we, are we then got a, yeah we got off to a good start in uh 2018 we should, we actually, I incorporated the uh, you know the Hall of Fame in, in uh, about four years ago, 2016, five years now. We held our first induction ceremony in Phoenix, Arizona, in 2018. Okay. And I purposely picked the site of the the former Phoenix Indian School, which is now a city park with a beautiful uh, renovated auditorium and visitor center. And we we inducted our first 12 members then. Uh, the next year, uh, we 
We're at the, the Cherokee tribe owned Hard Rock Cafe and Hotel in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Okay. And we inducted 12 more people there. And then we were all set for our third induction ceremony in a row when the COVID thing hit. And my board uh, decided that we weren't going to take any chances. We were just going to cancel it. And now I'm busy planning for our next ceremony, which is going to be at the First Americans Museum, which is $175 million facility, major tourist attraction in Oklahoma City. And that's November 6th, right? Yes. Okay. November 6th of, of this coming November. And what's even more exciting is when I was in Oklahoma for planning, down on the ground, planning uh, our event in Tulsa. I also wanted to see how they were progressing with that museum. I was kind of intrigued by it. I saw it online and they had the outside of it done, but they were still doing construction work inside. And I contacted their director and I asked if it would be possible to get a tour of their progress so far. And he said, sure. And so... We were touring around in there, and he was intrigued with the Hall of Fame idea, saw the possibilities for you know, nationwide reach. And uh, I told him that I was look, also looking at where we were going to build our facility. Uh, the state of Oklahoma was one of those places. So was Arizona. So was New Mexico. He said, why not here? And so we just recently, about a month or so ago, entered into a memorandum of agreement with the first nurse, uh, first. Americans Museum, where basically we're going to be building our facility onto theirs. Wow. Well, congratulations. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of disappointed it's not in Great Falls. <laughs> I understand you have some qualifiers about some warm weather all year long. Yeah. We, we don't meet that yeah, quite, yeah, you yeah. know. We get 365 or 364 days where it's really warm. It's just one cold day well, in here. The, the, the good news, though, is that, you know, our main objectives are number one, to build a facility. Number two, develop educational curriculum for mm-hmm. schools across the country. We just did that. We have 24 lesson plans you know, on our current 24 inductees. Uh, we just did a mail out to uh, Indian boarding schools, tribal colleges, public schools in Washington, Idaho, Oregon, Montana, and Wyoming and North and South Dakota that have you know Indian populations in those schools, basically with a poster that shows all the inductees. And you can it has our website information on there. And then you can also use the QR codes where with a smartphone, you can pull up our, our lesson plans or curriculum, as well as our website. We want educators, you know, to use this curriculum to help. Press the close of the app. Yeah. Yeah. Get the students to understand, you know, that, you know, these are people that you need to know about too, when you study American history, mm-hmm. you know, or, or if you're studying science, uh, you can look up uh, Mary Ross, who helped develop our space program. Or John Harrington, who was an astronaut, you know. So we have we have people in different categories that that have achieved greatness. You know, just need to be aware of that, and 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 needs to be taught in our schools because that's where you start. So we're trying to move that along, but we also have as one of our object- objectives is to have a traveling exhibit, and I would love love nothing more than to bring the traveling exhibit into Great Falls, you know, either at the, the Interpretive Center or the Russell Museum. So I can share that, you know, with my hometown. Excellent idea. I like it. We we have to be the first to know. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we could do breaking no- news on a podcast that doesn't air then for another week. Well, no, we could. <laughs> Rebecca, we can plan. We're not, you know, we Buffalo qualify. jump planners qualified, but we can still plan to record <laughs> yeah, it over yeah. this, yeah. the See, day that you, it's you, released. You, get, you gotta get that Buffalo jump planning uh, certification you know, seal. Yeah. That's, that's way up there. And I You're still like the wax on, wax off. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just saying, if it's going to be a week, we can plan. It's just oh, an episode, Rebecca. Okay. We can do this. We can do this. We're not big planners. But if you ever offer credential in Buffalo Jump Planning, we'll certainly take there it. Go. I think that would be a unique course that, you know, you could sell. Pretty much has or, or emergency management because... <laughs> Hey guys, this is what we're doing, and I need you to have contingency plans. Exactly, because what if that buffalo they don't cooperate? Right, and then I need backups because you really can't have a a buffalo jump planning seal without four guys behind you that are qualified as well. Because that's that's part of the contingency. It's a team. Yeah, team. Get the horses. (laughs) (laughs) That didn't go at all according to plan. Well, we've had a blast. I've had a blast. I have two, and I. This isn't going to be our only episode where you're here with us because 
I want to know more about the TP different buildings because I've had a touch and go from education from the Lewis and Clark Interpretive Center. So we need more. More. So obviously we'll we'll be in touch. <laughs> <laughs> well, think about this. There's ample information about who invented a lot of different things in the world, you know, Michelangelo forward, right? Mm-hmm. I'm seriously considering taking a patent out on a TP design and claiming that I invented it. Perfect. Yeah. Wouldn't go over well. I think there'd be so many, <laughs> so many of my people would want to kill me. <laughs> but if you were pretty sneaky about it, yeah, you know, maybe right. first got a sneak credential. Yeah. No, I think they would just say, James, that's in the public domain. Uh-huh. Don't be stupid. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. We had to learn. Yeah. We, uh... we didn't know. Yeah, well, you could classify it somehow for the unknown, the people who have no idea how to do this. One thing you don't want to do is build a TB in front of a dam. Well, we're no dam experts or TB ones either. Go. She got the segue. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, James, we want to again thank you for coming on this podcast and telling your story and the Native Americans people's stories, just a touch of it. And we can't wait to have you on the show again. So until you come back and until you listeners join us in Great Falls, I hope you're having fun wherever you are. And we look forward to seeing you soon here in the greatest damn town. We are no damn experts is the recorded claims from Great Falls, Montana, covering what you need to know about this amazing damn town. Damn, that felt good. On the next episode of War No Damn Experts, Rebecca and Madi are joined by a craft cocktail maker and a craft beer maker, yet neither of them brought their concoctions with them. Instead, we talk about all the concerts that are coming to Great Falls this summer with Downtown Summer Jam. War No Damn Experts was produced by Great Falls Montana Tourism with original music from the best damn musician, Joel Corda.